Now, I'm just going to talk about how to receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, reading from Luke 11, verse 9, I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given. There are no exceptions. The Bible says, Everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. There are no ifs, there are no buts, there are no maybes. Nobody is too bad to receive the Holy Spirit, and nobody is too good to receive the Holy Spirit. You haven't got to wait until you get victory over cigarettes or victory over beating your wife. If you're still smoking and beating your wife, man, you need the Holy Ghost like crazy. If you ask for bread, he'll give you bread and not a stone. And if you ask for fish, he'll give you fish and not a serpent. And if you ask for eggs, he'll give you eggs and not scorpions. And if you want to know what the Holy Ghost is, the Holy Ghost is bread, fish, and eggs. Glory to God, nobody ever picked up a devil or a demon coming to receive the Holy Spirit. I don't care how many times you've been prayed for, have hands laid on. Uh, the fault has always been your own. And I do not want you to come out and try to make a liar out of Jesus in front of me and keep on saying, give it to me, Jesus, give it to me, Jesus, please, Jesus, please, Lord, hallelujah, Lord, amen, Lord, I love you, Jesus, you know I need it, Lord, please give it to me, Lord. And I certainly don't want you to look up to me or any other worker and say, well, I came and asked, but I didn't receive. I won't have you making a liar out of Jesus. He said, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. And he said, if you knock, it'll be opened unto you. Now, God's the God of now, and he's not the God of tomorrow. So it's for you, and it's for you now. Praise the Lord. And every one of you, without exception, will receive unless you deliberately close your heart and mind to the truth and shut yourself off from the Word. If you don't turn off to the Word of God, you won't be able to help receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God. The question is not, Lord, will you give me the Holy Spirit? The question is, will you receive the Spirit's baptism? It rests with you like everything that Christ has made available to us through his work on the cross. The question is, will you receive? Trouble is that we've forgotten how to receive. We've become professional beggars, and uh, we just keep on begging God. We've got to stop begging and start receiving. And the only way to receive is to receive. There's no other way. Howard Horton, many years ago, in his book on the gifts of the Spirit, points out that if you want a glass of water when you go to the water faucet, you don't turn around and start wondering whether you've paid your water bill. You don't start wondering about the water. You simply turn it on, fill the glass up, and you start drinking. Jesus said, let him come unto me and drink. He didn't say, let him come unto me and pray. Let him come unto me and beg. Let him come unto me and seek my face. He said, if you're thirst, come unto me and drink. And that's all you do when you want to receive the Spirit's baptism. It is unscriptural to come out here and start saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's not only unscriptural, but if that's a form of praying, it's repetitious. It's similar to the prayers of the heathen, and it ought never to be prayed among the people of God. I've been studying the ways of the Hindus for many, many years of my life, and still am, because I'm interested in Indian souls for Christ. And when they pray, they recite the names of their God consistently. That's their prayer service. They come together and they repeat the names of their God. Now, if it's praise, it's all right. Praise can be repetitious, but not prayer. The Lord said, don't pray like the heathen do. If it's prayer, it's all wrong. So I don't want you to come out here and start saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Or hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Nor does God expect you to come out here and say, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. He knows whether you love him or not. What he expects you to do is to come out here and say, Jesus, I have come to receive the Spirit's baptism. I've come to drink. Open your mouth and start drinking. And if you do any more or less than that, you're certainly not on scriptural grounds. Now, on the day of Pentecost, 
The Bible tells us that they were in one place praying, and uh, suddenly there was this sound, the mighty rushing wind, in the entire area of Jerusalem, not just by the few that had gathered together. The cloven tongues like as a fire, you know the story so well. When that wind came, it did nothing but make them aware that the Holy Spirit had now come to the earth. He'd now taken up his residence in the earth. And he was about ready to fill them with his fullness. They knew he'd come by the sound of the mighty rushing wind. They knew he'd come because they saw the cloven tongues like as a fire sitting upon the heads of the 120 that were gathered together. Now today we don't need the sound of the mighty rushing wind and we don't need the cloven tongues like as a fire because we know that the Holy Spirit is here. But they did not know the moment of his arrival until those signs were granted. When Jesus came into the world, there was a star appeared in the east and they knew that the word of God had been fulfilled and this child had been born because of the star. Today, when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you haven't got to see a star in the east. They knew the Holy Spirit had come because of the wind and the cloven tongues as a fire. Now that the Holy Spirit is here, we don't need the mighty rushing wind and we don't need the cloven tongues like as a fire because he's here. Now, if the Holy Spirit is here, then you're not going to have a problem being baptized. If you haven't got to come and wait for the mighty rushing wind or the cloven tongues like as a fire, you haven't got to wait because the Holy Spirit's here, then from the very moment you hit this altar, you can enter in and have the Spirit's baptism. Now the Lord told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. Now the reason why they had to wait was because the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But after Jesus had been glorified and the Holy Spirit was given, no longer was it necessary for any to wait. So they waited at Pentecost. But forever after, the Bible order was to repent and be baptized and receive the Spirit's baptism right there and then. Praise the Lord. It was an instant job. You didn't have to wait for a day or a week or a month or a year. You didn't have to give proof that you were really and truly saved. You didn't have to go forth and be a good boy for six months and then come back and you were ready for the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a reward for being good. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a prize to be obtained. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit himself, is God's gift to every believer. It is your birthright. It belongs to you. If you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's because you haven't been taught right and you're living below your privileges. A young man said to me the other night, he said, I just can't, I just can't. I didn't want to tell him the truth because I didn't want to offend him by any means. The Bible says, everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Let God be true and every man a liar. If you haven't received, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. If you haven't received, it's because either you've not been taught or you're just stubborn or you are rebellious. So I'm teaching you that eliminates one possibility. I'm sure you're not going to continue to be rebellious and you've no desire to be stubborn. So you come and you say, Lord, I have come to receive. I'm going to drink. If I offer this book to you, how does it become yours? You don't come out here and say, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very good of you. I need that book. That's exactly what I've been after. My, how I need that book. You put out your hand and you simply take the book. 
And the very moment you take it, it's yours, and nobody can take it from you. And the very moment you open your mouth, bless God, and start exercising your faith and believe to receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's baptism is yours, and nobody can take it from you. My father told me many years ago, I was just a young lad, he said, Son, there'll always be people who will be able to argue you out of your beliefs or your doctrinal position and stand. But he said there'll never be a devil or a demon that will be able to argue you out of your own personal experience. And when you come out here on the authority of what Christ has said himself and drink of his spirit, no argument will be sufficient to talk you out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? The same way you receive Jesus as Savior. How did you receive Jesus as Savior? You said, all right, Jesus, I receive you now as my Savior. Be merciful to me, a sinner. It was just that simple. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? You say, Lord Jesus, I now receive the Spirit's baptism. And I thank you for it. Now, there are no ifs, there are no buts, there are no maybes. The moment you say, I now receive, and I thank you for it, you have received. I don't care whether you feel good or whether you feel bad. It is not based on feeling, it's based on facts. And what better facts can you have than the unfailing word of Jesus Christ himself? You couldn't talk me out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit no matter how you tried. It is impossible. That's one thing that's impossible. You could not talk me out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know I have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, if you ask, you'll receive. I asked, so I received. How do I know I received? I know I received because he said, if you ask, you receive. And if anyone dare come to this altar to receive and then go back saying, I didn't receive, you're either trying to make a liar out of Jesus or you're covering up personality hang-ups in yourself. Now, I can't deal with all your personality hang-ups. You know what I mean. And you may have some hang-ups and hook-ups in yourself. But at least be honest and say, I went down there, but I didn't receive because of personality hang-ups and hook-ups. I didn't receive because of mental blocks. I didn't receive because of preconceived ideas. I didn't receive because of rebellion. I didn't receive because I'm stubborn. I didn't receive because I'm afraid to open my mouth and start making sounds. I'm scared it might be me. It'll be you, all right. And if it isn't you, you're in trouble. Devils and demons take people over and make them do things against their will. God never, ever takes people over and makes them do things against their will. If you don't will to receive, God's not going to make you receive. If God won't make the sinner that's going to hell get saved in spite of himself, he's not going to make you stubborn Christians receive the Holy Ghost in spite of yourself. The sinner has got to turn around and say, I will to receive the Lord Jesus. I will to believe. I will to be saved. And that moment, he'll be saved. God will make it good. And you've got to turn around and say, I will to receive the Holy Spirit. And I now receive on the authority of the word of Jesus. That moment, God will make it good. And you'll go off shouting and talking in tongues. When you receive the Holy Spirit... The promise is not that you'll receive joy, not that you'll receive great insight into the Scripture. The promise is not that you will receive a wonderful peace. The promise is very clear. The promise is unto you and to your children and to your children's children and to as many as are far off. And that promise involves talking in tongues. When you have received, the evidence that you have received will be your speaking forth in other tongues. And if you don't speak forth in other tongues, it's because you didn't receive. You might have come down here and acted like you received, but you didn't receive. It's not that God didn't give. He gave. You didn't take. 
If you take, you'll talk in tongues. Oh, praise God. Reminds me of the story of the old crow. This old crow used to hang out in a high tree not far away from a pigeon coop. And he noticed that the pigeons had a pretty wonderful kind of a life. They were fed a couple of times a day and had nests and coops built for them to rest themselves out of the heat of the day or the cold of the night. This old crow decided that was the way to live. He wanted to be like those pigeons and, and take it easy and have it made. So he thought to himself, well, the best thing for me to do is to hang around and listen to them and see if I can learn the talk. So he hung around up there in that high perch and listened to all the chirps and squeaks that the pigeons make till finally he'd gotten it off perfect. Day came when he was ready to move in and live it up for the rest of his life. No more hunting for his food. No more staying out in the cold and struggling to build his nest. Going to move in with the pigeons. He learned the talk. So while they were busy feeding, he swooped down from this high old perch of his in that tree and made his way in from behind, began to have a time. I'm going to tell you, he really felt like he had it made. He was making all the right noises and feasting at the same time. All of a sudden, and for no apparent reason, the pigeons quit and they turned their attentions upon him. And soon they attacked in mass. They pulled almost every feather out of his body. He just got away in time. When he got back up there and had a higher perch of his, he began to think it over. He wanted to find out where he went wrong. And then he discovered that he'd forgotten one important thing. He'd forgotten to study the walk. He'd studied the talk but forgot about the walk. And he wasn't walking like the pigeons walked. He was talking like they talked, but not walking like they walked. And they saw that the walk wasn't right. And so they drove him out. So he learned to talk the walk, but not walk the talk. And there are people that know how to say praise God and amen and hallelujah. They know how to come down and say Jesus, 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 and hallelujah, 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 and fill me, fill me, fill me, and I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, and bless me now, Lord, and help me now, and do it, Lord, and all the rest of it. They've learned how to talk the walk, but they haven't learned how to walk the talk. You're coming down here to receive. You can say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus as much as you like after you've received. You can tarry after you've received. But you must come and receive. You must come and have one only thought in your mind. I am going to receive the Spirit's baptism. You come down here, you say, Lord Jesus, you're the baptizer. I'm the candidate. Baptize me now. Thank you for it, Jesus. Then immediately... Knowing he cannot lie, and he's done what he said he would do, you begin to enter into another dimension of praise and worship. You begin to speak in other tongues. Now, don't go home and say, well, praise God, I didn't get the tongues, but I got the joy. That wasn't what happened at Pentecost. Don't go home and say, I didn't get the tongues, but I got an insight into the Scriptures. Don't go home and say, I didn't get the tongues, but I got wonderful peace. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is coming back for a tongue-talking church. Hallelujah. And if you have not received the Spirit's baptism and come into liberty and freedom in tongues, no matter how sanctified or petrified you may be, you're not ready to meet the Lord. I didn't say you were not saved. I said you're not ready to meet the Lord. You can call it the glossolalia if you like, but it's the same thing. When you're sick, the first thing the doctor says is, let's have a look at your tongue. And the day is coming when we as ministers are going to say to Christians that come up for prayer because of weakness and disease, we're going to say, let's have a look at your tongue. 
I'm going to tell you, if you talk in tongues four hours a day, you'll never be sick. We don't talk in tongues enough. Reason why the devil is having his way is because we've quit ministering in the Spirit. We ought to talk in tongues, pray in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit. Talk in tongues and sing in tongues. There's a liberty, there's a freedom, there's a release, there's a power, there's a build-up. Oh, praise God, there's a hotline through to heaven. Let me tell you something, friends. The only thing that's changed is you have traded out your liberty in tongues for other manifestations and operations. We don't talk in tongues anymore. We're ashamed to talk in tongues. Of course, we don't mind using slang and colloquialisms and a few curses here and there if we're really upset. But we don't talk in tongues anymore. When you talk in tongues, you don't know what you're talking about. And we want to know what we're talking about or rather whom we're talking about. You'll never criticize your neighbor when you're talking in tongues. You'll always magnify Jesus when you're talking in tongues. You'll have a revival when you get loose in tongues. If you women would stop nagging your husbands and just talk in tongues and minister in the Spirit, there'd be more of them saved and a lot quicker. The devil wants to bind your tongue. He wants to keep you from liberty and freedom in the Holy Ghost. When you defy the devil and let the world know that this is a tongue-talking church, then you'll be on your way. What is this church famous for? Well, I'd say you have one of the finest choirs I've ever encountered. Is that what you're famous for? I know you've got a fantastic radio broadcast, and you're going to have some more. Is that what you're going to be famous for? I know you've seen out some fine preachers. Is that what you're famous for? Let's be famous for talking in tongues. Hallelujah. For people that talk in tongues are liberated in the Spirit. They are released. They are free. Hallelujah. They are in another realm with God. Praise the Lord. When I was in New Zealand, people would ring me long distance from the United States. People that had needs. And I'm going to tell you it cost a lot of money for those phone calls. But do you know, many, many times they would burst out into tongues. And they thought so much of tongues that they would speak them freely and at length when it was costing them $17 for every three minutes. Jesus said, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. He said, if you knock, it'll be opened unto you. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? The same way you receive anything, simply by saying, thank you, I have now received it. Then you take the next step. Abandon yourself to God. Forget about your neighbor. Glory to God. Forget about the person next to you. Forget about me. Forget about how you look. Forget about how you sound. You've received the Holy Spirit. And because you've received the Holy Spirit, enter in right now and begin to worship God in spirit. When you worship God in spirit, you're worshiping God in tongues. I told you a little bit about tongues. Let me repeat that. People say, well, how can I speak in tongues? How do you speak in tongues? Well, I can't teach you to speak in tongues. But I can remove some of your fears. People are afraid of breaking the sound barrier. Now, when you talk in tongues, what are you doing? You're making sounds. That's all you're doing. Except that the Spirit of the living God is behind those sounds and in those sounds. All language is sound. If I were to say, That would probably not mean very much to you. But in Hindustani it would be a very polite thing to say. Those words were the words of an actual language. Those words are the words of an actual language. If I were to say, Those words are the words of an actual language. They mean, have faith in God in the Maori tongue. 
All language is sound and all sound is language. If I say da, I'm saying yes in the Albanian tongue. If I say ja, I'm saying yes in German. If I say si, I'm saying yes in Spanish. If I say we, oui, I'm saying yes in French. If I say hi, I'm saying yes in Japanese. If I say I, I'm saying yes in the Maori language. If I say ha or ji ha, I'm saying yes in the Hindustani. So that if I were just to make those sounds, da, hi, si, we, ya, I, ha, I'm saying yes, yes, yes. What better thing can you say to the Lord? So you come out and you say, Jesus, I'm now going to receive the Holy Spirit according to your word. Then you say, thank you, Jesus. I have now received. It's just that quick. You don't wait till you feel a hot pack or a cold chill. Glory to God. You don't wait to hear a mighty rushing wind or see cloven tongues like as a fire. You don't wait for any physical reaction. You are in the realm of faith. This is not your flesh. This is your spirit. Your spirit is being immersed or baptized in the Holy Ghost. You say, Jesus, I have come to receive the Spirit's baptism. Then you say, thank you, Jesus, I have now received. Immediately following that, you surrender to your human spirit, now immersed in the Holy Spirit, your faculties of speech. When I preach a sermon, sometimes someone will come and say, Why, Brother Bloomfield, God really spoke to us tonight. And I think, well, I guess he did, but I'm the one that's hoarse. In other words, if God is talking to you through me, don't ever forget that it's my tongue and it's my teeth and it's my lips and it's my vocal cords. God is behind my tongue, my teeth, my lips and my vocal cords. And if I didn't open my mouth and raise my voice and be bold enough to get up here and say, Thus saith the Lord, and then say something you wouldn't hear from God. You see what I mean? We've got to be available to God. The question is, are you available to God? The Bible says the tongue is an unruly member. It says, who can tame the tongue? And about the hardest thing in the world is to get people to give that tongue to God. When you give that tongue to God, it gets tamed. Nothing like tame tongue. You give your tongue over to the Lord. Now when you give it over to the Lord, that doesn't mean that you say, Okay, Lord, you can have my tongue. Now suppose I were going to raise an offering right now. Getting cold in here again. Suppose I were going to raise an offering and you're sitting back there and say, Okay, Lord, I'll give you my money. But until you put your hand in your bank pants pocket and pull out that pocketbook of yours and take out that money and actually give it to God, He hasn't got it no matter how many times you say, I'll give you my money, Lord. You don't say, Lord, I'll give you my money. Now you're going to have to mysteriously creep up on me and slip it out of my bill folder without me knowing about it. If you do that, it's yours, Lord. So when you say, Lord, I'm going to give you my tongue, you don't say, well, Lord, here's my tongue. Now get a hold of it and wag it if you want to. You don't say, Lord, here is my voice, but you're going to have to make it work if you want it. When you give God your money, you open your wallet, you take out the bills and you give it to the Lord. When you give God your voice, you say, Lord, here's my voice. Ah! And don't let any old hypocrite fool you. If you don't do it that way, you're not giving it to him at all. Open my mouth and wag my tongue and tickle my tonsil. Can you see what I'm getting at? So you say, all right, God, I've received the Holy Spirit's baptism and I thank you for it. Now the next step is to start exercising this God-given ability that you now have to commune with God in the Spirit. And the way to do this is through the operation of tongues. In order to speak in tongues, you must make available to God the faculties of your organs of speech. 
So you say, Lord, here is my voice. Ah, is this unscriptural? Certainly not. This is very intelligent and reasonable. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable duty. It is unreasonable to suggest that God should have to get a hold of you and shake the living lights out of you until you start to squeak. That's unthinkable. I'm not happy about God taking people over. People must give themselves over to God. Only the devil takes people over. Satan will take you over without you giving yourself to him. God won't take you over. You must yield yourself to the Lord. The Bible tells us to yield to God, surrender to God, give yourself over to God. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now let's do it to the Lord. Give God your voice. Ah, there's your voice. What about giving God your tongue now? So you don't put your tongue out and say, well, here it is, God. Do with it what you will. You raise your voice and you give God your tongue. La, 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 la. You got it going at least. Now you give him your lips. In other words, the faculties of speech are now totally given over to God. You've received the baptism. You know because God can't lie. Now you've surrendered and yielded all your faculties of speech. Now the utterance that comes forth is of God and his mysteries in the Spirit. When people realize that they are being put on the spot, when they realize that they are being challenged to receive from the Lord themselves, they either enter in or they sneak away and hope they're not going to be noticed. Because we've had it on a silver platter for too long. And we say, God, if you want to save me, you're going to have to do it yourself. If you want to heal me, you're going to have to do it sovereignly. If you want to fill me with the Spirit, you're going to have to do it sovereignly and all by yourself. Don't expect me to cooperate. Now that's the attitude of people. And this is why people don't get healed. Of course, God is sovereign. He can do anything sovereignly. Because God is a sovereign God. Nevertheless, the Bible pattern is clear. You are to believe the Word of God. Believing the Word of God, you receive. Knowing that you've received on the authority of the Word of God, you now move in and make these faculties of speech available to the Lord. Take the healing ministry, for instance. The Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick. All right. When you lay your hands on the sick, God will honor that exercise of faith. He'll make it good and he'll heal the sick. But suppose you turn around and say, God, I'm not going to lay my hands on the sick. If you want to heal them, you're going to have to do it yourself. That's not pleasing to the Lord. Let us make up our minds that we are going to receive baptism in the Holy Spirit the Bible way. Those that are already baptized, make up your minds that you are going to have another dip in the fountain. You're going to come into liberty and freedom in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is the first step toward the ministry of the miraculous. It's the first step inside the portals of the supernatural. Speaking in tongues exercises your spirit, it builds up your faith, it magnifies God, it's a witness to the unbelievers, it's direct communion with God, it's the Holy Ghost unto manifestation, it is the language of the truly redeemed, and it's the open sesame to the supernatural. These are reasons, friends, why you should want to speak in tongues tonight. If you'd like to be able to speak in tongues freely, raise your hands, will you? Yes. It's the race that remains to the people of God. It's the new thing that God is doing. It's the refreshing promise by the Lord. It's the restoration. It'll help bring back Jesus. He's coming back for a glorious tongue-speaking church. And it will identify you with what God is doing in the land. Praise the Lord. Now, if you want to receive the Spirit baptism tonight, all you need to do is repent. And then be converted. And have your sins blotted out. And the Bible says, you'll receive the refreshing. I want every head bowed for a moment, please. There are people here tonight that are not in the place with God that they ought to be. Oh, I don't mean by that that there's some terrible secret sin 
point in your life. I just mean that you're not living and moving in the spirit realm of things. You come to church and you come to enjoy the program. You don't mind tapping your foot. You don't mind clapping your hand. You don't mind putting a little bit in the offering. But as far as being a joint that supplies, as far as being available to God, as far as being willing to move in and minister at the right time and as the Lord leads, you've wanted none of that. There are people here that have not spoken in tongues for a week, for a month, for a year. There are some here that were hurt on one occasion because they were set down by the pastor. And fear entered your heart. And ever since you have hidden that talent in a napkin and buried it in the earth. Some of your children are away from God. But they never wandered away until you lost the victory in times. There was a time when you were proud to say, I'm Pentecostal. A time when you were happy to say, yes, I speak with other tongues. But not anymore. You've become ashamed. Fear has taken over. And the glory is gone. But you say, Lord, tonight I'm coming back. I want this rest. I want this refreshing. I want this revival. I want to enter into the supernatural way of things. I want to be available to edify and bless the body of Christ. This is your heart's desire. This is what you're talking to God about right now. You say, Lord, I'm willing to talk in tongues. Before I came to the service, I wanted to give to miracles. But now, Lord, I'll be very happy to start at the bottom, as it were, and move into this realm and trust you to take me on. You're saying something like that. I want to see you raise your hand right now. I'm going to pray for you. Yes, 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 all over the building. Bless God for these truthful, humble people. God bless you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, friends, freedom in tongues is a spiritual barometer. It locates us. It lets us see just exactly where we are in the Lord. When you begin to dry up spiritually, you've lost your liberty in tongues. When you lose your liberty in tongues... You've lost your communion in the Spirit with God. And there are some others here tonight that haven't got this liberty. And you want it. You put your hand up. I want to pray for you. Put it up now. Yes, that's better. Praise God. Praise God. How many people say, Brother Bloomfield... I want to be available to God as never before. Put your hand up. Yes. I want all of those that raised their hands first to stand right where you are. God bless you. Just get right up and God bless you as you do. And they're getting up everywhere and thank the Lord for it. God bless you. God's getting his army ready. Hallelujah. My great army. A new thrashing instrument that has teeth. He's getting his army ready. I want you to come down the front. I'm going to pray for you because I appreciate you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to stand facing me, if you will, and God bless you for my line. God bless you. God bless you. Some people coming down to get saved. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
How long ago is it, brother, since you were really free in tongues? Quite a while. You're going to be free tonight. Sister? Quite a while? Brother? Quite a while. Brother? Brother? Quite a while. Bless your dear heart. Do you know what? When you come into liberty and freedom in tongues, you'll never have a nervous breakdown. Put your hand up and say amen. You'll never have a nervous breakdown and you'll never lose your mind. Tongue-talking saints never lose their minds. Put your hands up and say amen. How long ago, sister, since you were really free? I'm not at home. How long? You never have been free, sister. You've never been free, brother. You've never been free. You've never been free, brother. You've never been free, brother. How long ago? Brother, not free. Never. Twenty years. You've yearned for it and never had it, little girl. Sister, several years you want to be available to God. Praise the Lord. Embarrassed. You need the freedom. You've never been fully released. Never. Just the same. Never. Just got the Holy Spirit this morning. Praise the Lord. All right. Now listen. I want to say something. There are others in the building too that haven't come for reasons known best to themselves. But you are the body of Christ. And if the body is not free, then Jesus is limited. He moves through his body. He said, it's expedient that I go away because I'm limited in this body of mine. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it fall into the ground and die, it will bring forth much fruit. He's gone back to heaven and now he ministers through you. If you're not free, then the measure of your bondage or the, of your release is the measure of Jesus that can flow from you to the world. Do you see what I mean?